Welcome to one of the strangest and what I think is one of the most important videos that I've done on this channel because at the heart of the book that I'm going to discuss today, which is actually a game, a role-playing game, um, is an unconscious conflict that I've had within my mind. I don't know if it's a conflict or something that I'm trying to understand that speaks really deeply to who I am as a person, how I was, my mind was sort of formed in childhood. The, the things that are deeply important to me um, in life are, are, I think, very connected to what I'm going to discuss today around this book. Um, and it happened to be this book. I think, you know, there is something special about Morkborg uh, that I'll talk about that's from this Swedish game developer. Um, but I want to first Nate, tell you a bit like what what were my inspirations for doing this video in the past month. So this is working within my conscious mind. And then I'll start to branch out into some of the more unconscious things that have been going on throughout this project and throughout my life because they connect directly. Consciously, I was inspired to do this video um, by uh, one uh, Nate from Books You Haven't Read um, did a video on experimental reads that he had done, and I had already been in the mode of thinking about generative literature by, by reading Italo Calvino, for example, Invisible Cities and Cosmic Comics, uh, where he, he kind of just generates these novels out of creative exercises, or the one he did about tarot cards that isn't that great. Um, but, you know, it's hit and miss, obviously, but the point is experimentation through literature as a medium that can be interactive uh, to the mind, um, that can even be, be tactile, in a tactile way, interactive through games with dice, like this sort of uh, role-playing game that, and I mean, come on, as a, as a Wisconsinite, you know, Wisconsin's the birthplace of Dungeons and Dragons, so um, I feel com that it's completely right for me to do the honor of this kind of game as being included as part of a Read Around the World project. It's an important aspect of storytelling and literature that exists today and perhaps exists in the past, but anyway, Nate, from uh, books you haven't read, uh, talked about a book that was basically, I can't remember the number, was it 99 or 50, I don't know, iteration, a book that was just scenario, at, the same scenario over and over playing out differently. And this is of course like basically a book that is a writing exercise, it sounds like, turned into a novel. And then he shows another book early in the video. I mean, I'll link this, this video in the description that, um, the, the design of the book itself really is part of the engagement. And this has also, I think, been done in, in modern, postmodern novels like uh, House of Leaves, which I personally never really got into, but I always thought the idea was very interesting. And I'm going to talk about that as well. Like, uh, we'll get there. But uh, the other inspiration for this video was a, ch a channel that I've been really getting into called Man Alone. And that's where I first uh, saw Morkborg being kind of played out. Actually, the way it worked is I had seen, I was at my local game store where they sell like board games and, and they have a section of these types of, uh, of role-playing game books that, again, you can play with your friends or some of them just alone if, uh, if you're imaginative and have some way of generating scenarios like a, like a tarot card deck or, um, or dice roll charts. Um, and I will say I, I have never really been in, I've never played these kinds of games a lot. I've had a history of course with video games. Um, but these sorts of games for me, I've always sort of been on the fringes of, but I remember even back to my very early childhood, always when I'd be at friends' houses or in a bookstores, and in fact, I grew up in a bookstore because my dad owned one in a mall. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it was like a, a chain type of, of store, but I would, I would look at these books, um, uh, Morkborg, being a, a modern example of them, but back then it would have been like Dungeons and Dragons and look at the monsters and the lore of the world. And um, 
and just the different statistics and the way think about the way things could play out and just having this book that allowed me to create a whole world of possibilities in my head a world that i could enter that just with some dice i could imagine this whole thing playing out in different ways seemed so interesting and so exciting to me in fact more so even i i will say that was more exciting to me as a child and i'd say for most of my life um uh, more intriguing even than going to a fantasy world like Lord of the Rings or J.R.R. Tolkien. And it's simply because I, I find that interaction is what I really seek. I feel this urge to create, to be creative as well as to consume uh, things and just passively, well, some would say it's not passively to, to engage with a book and then apply that to your life. But there's, there's, I don't, there's all kinds of issues with that. I'm only speaking from my experience here. I'm not going to uh, judge or try to surmise what other people experience. You can listen to what they have to say themselves because they are the better experts on that. Um, so is this is where I came to, yeah, Man Alone, who has this video about Morkborg. Uh, and, and I watched a few other of his videos and thought they were really interesting about these, uh, you know, specifically this game and then how you can use games to explore your shadow self. This is another thing. I've always been a bit skeptical of this shadow self idea. Um, I'm starting to understand it more in the context of the society that I live in that is becoming increasingly abstracted. Um, the work we do is abstracted in many cases. I mean, I my work is on a computer the entire day um, in a digital realm with no actual physical element that I can see. It affects things in the physical world, but I don't ever actually see them. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, Every, everything that manages our lives, the payments we make, it's like it's, we live in this, in this world that is at this point impossible for us to completely understand. We only know what we have to do to achieve certain results and nobody really understands how this whole thing works as a whole. Uh, in a way that I think in the past societies could actually be understood by a a small, at least a small group of people could actually understand the way this entire society that they um, are in charge of is working. At least that's what I think. Um, so in this in this realm of abstraction, where we all have, you know, at least in my society, have so many more uh, choice, so much more choice and individual rights. We have everything you could want is practically at your fingertips. I mean, look at this. In practically one to two years, I have collected a book from every single country in the world. That doesn't mean I'm reading every single one to completion, but I did it. I have a collection of a book by an author from every single country in the world, and it wasn't that expensive, honestly, if you um, consider how expensive some other hobbies are and the amount of time that I've spent on it. If I would have spent that same amount of time on just about any other hobby, it would have been exponentially more expensive. And so... Um, and of course, I'm speaking in my country, in my in my place. But then you get thinking about, well, you know, what's what's the purpose of my time here on life? Some will simply say there is no purpose. You make of it what you want. That's never quite been uh, good enough for me, I guess. There's a certain conscience to me that says, well, you know, we we really do all have a responsibility to try to understand what's going on in the world. But just the process of doing that. I'm starting to realize is is world building in itself. I see so many uh, different, you know, and, and we all get this, right? On a daily basis, we're getting so many concepts of the world thrown at us. So many people have so many different ideas about what's supposed to be important, about what you should spend your time on, about what you should spend your money on. And you can't even, you can't even trust where a lot of this is is coming from you don't know you don't know any many of these people that are telling you this and this is me of course in my society being chronically online having a job that is completely online having 
you know, and having hobby, the, the, the way I connect my hobby to the world through this YouTube channel is completely online. And I'm simultaneously thankful and confused and tormented by that. So it's um, the, all these things go together. At, and all of these things were with me before I even began this project. And um, this is, uh, you know, at this point, this video is going off the rails. So let's just go with it. Uh, is this worth my time? Is a book like this that's a game, a world that I can enter into when I want and play the dice? And it's a dark world, by the way. Um, and I think, I, I think we've seen this in the past 20 years, especially this rise in post-apocalyptic. Uh, well, it started with a rise in post-apocalyptic fiction and literature, the Fallout games. I loved the Fallout games for a long time and I guess still do. They were a big part of... Uh, it, but it is fantasy. It's post. It's post-apocalyptic fantasy. I would say is more more so than science fiction. Um, but now we've even moved beyond that into things like you know the the whole from software video games, Dark Souls, now into Elden Ring, and now we get instead of post-apocalyptic fiction, uh, basically fiction where reality itself is just falling apart, and we are in some future or past, it doesn't really matter, time and place. And I think this is where Gene Wolfe in Book of the New Sun was vastly ahead of his time in, in the world he created in, in, that, uh, in there. Or maybe, maybe there were others doing what he was doing at the same time, like Jack Vance, I guess. I haven't read Jack Vance. But uh, yeah, Book of the New Sun is still, uh, for me, a phenomenal work of literature that I count among my top five uh, so it's, and, and that was before, that was pre-Mike Reads the World, okay? Um, but Morkborg connects directly to that and directly to this fascination with not just post-apocalyptic worlds, but worlds that have been through multiple apocalypses over time, where reality is, is just this malleable thing that's falling apart and all of our nightmares can come, come to fruition before our very eyes. And uh, when... Next to nothingness, the existence of nightmares, whether they be biological or uh, psychological or spiritual, whatever, they are actually a comfort uh, next to the idea of absolute nothingness in some ways. And that gets into an idea of a, a Gene Wolfe interview I recently saw where he said something akin just mind-blowing to me that I see in Book of the New Sun that life is the end point. There isn't actually like a point beyond life. Life itself is the end point, the, the objective of all things. And like that was a really powerful statement to me. And then, so when we're thinking about is a is a frivolous game where you can explore different aspects of your psychology. Now, is it frivolous if you're exploring different aspects of your psychology? Or should we all just be dedicated to making useful things and being kind to each other? Uh, you know, some very, just very, and be simple. And it, there's something to be said for all that right, to, 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 to reduce life to its most simple aspects and just be content with, with the simple, kind, and the useful. There is that part of me that, that sees that, and I think that's the part of me that connects to whatever idea I have about like Eastern philosophy or Buddhism, which I am the first to admit is, is, is I'm a complete novice in that, but I do like certain, that certain concept. And so let's keep going, let's keep going. There is a purpose to this before I even discuss uh, <laughs> Morkborg. Like if you're just interested in Morkborg, I'll probably put a timestamp in this video that just says like, go here, uh, yeah. But um, the idea of a book, okay? The idea of a book, often the concept is more potent to me than the, idea, than the actual reading itself. And uh, I think the greatest books, the, the, the books that I've found to be the greatest are the ones that are able to uh, meld the style with the concept in such a way that they are inseparable. And now I said I wasn't going to name names until the end, but I've already done it so many times. And so, damn it, Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, exploring this, this civilization on the brink of collapse, this this built-up 
ideal world of philosophies and experimenting with different ideas, the very thing I think that many of us can do with role-playing games and then watching it all fall apart at the end is like, like combined with his encyclopedic style, his analytical style of writing that I, that I was so engrossed by, um, the 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 style and the and what the story says and creates not what it says what it creates it feels like a 3d structure in my mind something that i can walk into and and even when i'm not reading it while i'm just walking around in my daily life and and talk to different characters in it in my head and then there's ovid's metamorphoses if we go back practically, you know, 1900 years before that, before the Magic Mountain, um, where change is, and now I'm appreciating it even more as I'm learning Latin by reading the Metamorphoses in Latin, along with some other aids, but I'm appreciating even more how the way that Ovid writes in Latin and how the best translators translate him actually through his style shows the change uh, uh, of the world and uh, reflects reflects back in that way of the stories that he's telling, um, which in, are based on myths that people took very seriously as uh, as religion. I'm sure at different points, but he's playing with them. He's creating a fantasy world, and uh, so you know these are these are just the heights. The or Gene Wolfe's book of the New Sun. I could uh, I'll have to do a different video about that at some point in the future, but that's up there too. So. The idea of book has, you know, of a book has to be generative. It has to be a concept that to me is, in my mind, generative of, uh, and allows me to separate the world of that book from what's going on. And so that idea of having, and it's not, it's not an ideal form. It's not like what the book is showing me is the ideal of how things should be. Oftentimes it's taking things to the extreme or, or yeah, taking things to absurd extremes is almost the place of literature. And, uh, I don't know. I, I'm going to, I haven't developed that idea enough. I feel like I'm getting distracted if I go down that route. So, um, I don't actually know another way to do this besides looking at a generative game, uh, a game that can generate story, a book that can generate many, many stories through dice, uh, through using tarot cards. I'm actually, I hope he doesn't mind because I haven't actually, you know, asked or anything, but I'm going to link Man Alone's uh, video in this one just, just if you're interested in like actually seeing how this game works, I think he does a much, uh, a really good job. Um, but the first thing you'll notice if you look at this book is the art style and um, how it, uh, it really, the, the game isn't even pre presented in a very straightforward way. Um, it's basically 16 minutes spoken of lore. There's actually, I couldn't believe this. There's a video on YouTube narrated by Wayne June, who, who uh, narrated uh, the video game Darkest Dungeon. And like he has the, for me, like my, my favorite audiobook voice of all time, even though I think he's done very few audio audiobooks that I'm actually interested in listening to. A few by H.P. Lovecraft, I know he's done. But, like, he does an outstanding job reading the 16 minutes of lore. I'm also going to link that in the in the description if you're interested. Um, but, in, and you can listen to that and get an idea of all of the text that's basically in here. But then we also have this art that's created, like, it's it's pretty metal, it's pretty brutal, you know, and uh, the whole world is very dark. There's some dark stuff in here, so obviously, like, content, uh, you know, you'll know if this is for you almost immediately. Um, basically, there's these two basilisks, who, uh, each of which have two heads, who uh, are involved with these prophecies that are foretelling the end of the world, uh, one of them specifically, and there's kind of, uh, there's some hints at there's like this, this dark god or mage or something behind it. Nothing is stated explicitly. You are given just this, 
60 pages of lore and rules told in this obtuse, um, uncomfortable, uh, some of these images, I think they were just using stuff in the public domain to make just these really, really kind of unsettling and, and, and dark and apocalyptic, uh, feeling art that, uh, it's just, it's just like the, the, this stuff, I don't know why, I don't know what it is about me seeking in fantasy worlds, this sort of extreme, um, it's not even serious. I'm not even looking for the serious. I mean, when you read Ovid Meta, Ovid's Metamorphoses, some of the stories are just so brutal and 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 so obscene. It's absurd. Like I, I feel bad, but I almost just laugh at how obscene and absurd they are. But you know, also we know apparently through what we're told through the media and stuff like you know. Crazy stuff happens in real life and history. You know, if you look at history, like barbaric stuff has happened, and and it is something that actually happens in life. And and stories can be kind of a way to understand or conceptualize these things without actually traumatizing ourselves, and perhaps prepare us for an eventuality where we may have to confront these things. But I don't know if any sort of fictitious understanding, I've struggled with this myself too, can any fictitious understanding of um, violence or tragedy or um, a world that is so miserable or sickness um, actually prepare you or um, uh, harden you? Do you want to be hardened to that or, or, or help you think? I think even just the process of thinking about this is what comes out of generative literature. If you're actually, if you're, if you're not allowing that fantasy world to overwhelm your reality, right? That is the challenge. That is the challenge because I think a lot of people do get sort of, they, they go to something just to get lost into it as, as a kind of numbing effect. But I think what I'm really getting at with generative literature here is the idea of creating a simulation that you know is a simulation um, where all the possibilities exist. And that you can't get from video games. Um, video games are incredibly restricting alongside something like Mork Borg, because you really have to use your imagination in a game like this, and especially playing by yourself. And I mentioned this this guy, Man Alone's channel, like, I, I admire so much how he's been able to say, um, like, straight up just, you know, I enjoy playing games by myself. I'm going to create a whole channel about these games that I just play by myself with a book, with dice in my head, and create all these stories and be creative. And I don't really care what anyone else thinks. Like, that, that, there is something admirable about that. I don't feel like I'm able to, at this point in my life, be that sort of, like, full-on, uh, you know, I can do that. But, and I don't even know if I will play this game. The more I'm talking about, the more I'm kind of justifying to myself that I really should, that I really think it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, especially in a society where we're already for forced to be so abstracted. Um, the, this is kind of a way to understand. You're using another abstract world with every possibility that's different from your own, that works with symbols, and if we want to use the union uh, terminology, archetypes, to help you understand the world that you have to deal with on a daily basis because the reality is like yeah my life probably is better than a lot of people in the in the world um in certain ways and then there's other people that are better off than i am and you know all of us do we have some responsibility towards society and toward each other to make things a better place sure but i mean also to what extent because at the end of the day we all still have to pay the bills, spend 40 hours of our life at least going to a job that probably isn't our favorite, our first pick of what we wanted to spend 40 hours of our life doing. But then would you really want to be doing 40 hours of anything? I have always thought of that too. Like what would I actually enjoy? I don't read 40 hours a week. Like that would be way too much reading um, for me. 
Uh, I, I wouldn't want to do anything 40 hours a week, right? So it's just like, there's there's always a certain level of grind, a certain level of like, we just gotta, we just gotta survive and get things done in this life and get along where we are. Um, and it, it is important to understand, I guess, our, well, no, I, I feel our impact upon the earth and how it's going to affect future generations. All of that is really important to try to understand, but I, there's also a part of me that says, well, the the changes that we make are, are can often be very limited. Uh, well, like what I can actually do is very limited, and that like, but having that understanding of limitation is good because it allows you to say, okay, well, I can still have fun too. I can just enter the, these games to have fun, and also while you're having fun you often learn things about life too. The idea of fun. I mean, what was the idea of fun in other societies uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago or whenever? That's, that's really interesting. Uh, that's a really interesting idea to explore too. I don't know. There's so much stuff around this, around this uh, Morkborg that I'm barely even talking about. I'm barely talking about the game itself because I think there's other people that do a better job than I have and I haven't even played it, but I have spent a good, you know, four or five hours looking, probably total since I bought this a month ago, um, looking at this book, uh, consuming some kind of content about it, imagining what could come out of a play session in this, even just looking at things like, you know, you can pick up a, you can pick up a random object uh, in this game or take a random trait. Okay, here's an here's a, an occult treasure you can find, right? A uh, silver bird cage that slays whatever is placed behind its bars slowly over one long night. That which is killed reanimates twice as strong as a raging con uncontrollable undead. I mean, what a strange Frankenstein piece of technology that must be, but using medieval terminology, like that is straight up Gene Wolfe right there. It's, uh, I mean, there's so many things around this that I'm talking about that I'm trying to come to terms with and maybe just trying to give my per myself permission to say it's like, it's okay. You can just play a game. You can just have fun. But then another part of me is like, nah, we're not just going to have fun. We're going to get crazy. We're going to we're gonna make this massive campaign that's going to last years. And then I'm like, okay, slow down. You know, I've got these multiple voices in my head, right? So um, around this, and it's, and it's a really big struggle over this idea of generative literature, but it's also all... It's also all being generated by my interaction with this generated literature and has since I was very young. And there's also probably something psychologically about how I grew up that I'll leave, I don't know, I'll leave that to the mysteries of the world. Um, but that is, that has driven me to seek some kind of um, fulfillment in an abstract, or not even an abstract, but a, a, uh, a different world and uh, that I think there's something there that to just connect directs directly connects to literature and to reading and uh, I don't I'm less and less convinced that anyone really reads to understand the world because understanding the world I don't think I'm gonna say this again understanding the world is a world building process and I am kind of more and more convinced of that you cannot even separate the two. And anyway, all of this also impacted me to pick up the Red Book by, uh, by Jung. Um, yeah, it, this, is, this is basically before generative uh, games and generative literature existed. Um, you could spew your subconscious into a book and draw some incredible... I mean, I don't have the one... I don't have the... Um, uh, what's the word? The, uh, oh, wow. I completely forgot that word. The one with the images and the original text. Uh, but yeah, this is just the text of the red book. But again, before this stuff existed, authors would just spew their subconscious onto a page. They had no other outlet. You know, they didn't have the technology. They didn't, um, they didn't, uh, I mean, I guess games, 
where you could roll dice or, or have some kind of like generative mechanism. Like what is the history of that? I could go down a rabbit hole here. Like before Dungeons and Dragons, where can we actually trace the history? I would argue you can trace it all the way to the I Ching from China. You know, that's your, your t it's a fortune telling device, but even one of the top translators, and I have a video on that, which I'll, I'll link as well, um, is, it calls it a game. One of John Minford, one of the top translators of the I Ching, will straight up say this is a game, even though it was used for very serious things in fortune telling. You're rolling dice to create stories. Understanding the world is a world building process out of generative literature. And then we can get into the question of do you think anything's truly random? Uh, does God play dice with the universe? Well, um, Cesar Vallejo would say yes. Uh, through his beautiful poem, uh, God's Dice, and uh, Albert Einstein, of course, would say no. So, um, you know, that's up to you. That's what we can all kind of try to figure out as we're playing these games of uh, generative literature in whatever ever form that may be. That seems like a good place to stop. Uh, so thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.